coming up. I've got to ask you to go back to 1970. The twin guitar sound. Of course, the Yardbirds had tried it briefly with Jeff Beck and Jimmy Page, and then Jeff disappeared. Where did the idea come for all the twin guitars with you and Ted as it was then? Great question. I think you've actually got to go back to 1967 because he, the band was actually formed in 69. But 67 was my year, I was 17. Uh, and it was the year of festivals, you know. I mean, it was also the summer of love, right? Mm -hmm. Or 67, 68. So I was traveling around England doing all these festivals and I was seeing bands um, that were later to really inspire the music that we made. And one of them, in particular, was Fairport Convention. I, I loved their take on English folk, folk rock as it became. But there was one band um, called Blossom Toes, which featured the guitarist Jim Cregan, and they were the first band that I had actually seen using two guitars in a way that I thought was interesting. I'd actually been in a little band called The Decoys, which was a mod band in about 66, and we were dabbling with twin lead guitars in our own kind of Heath Robinson sort of fashion. So I was completely unaware of the Allman Brothers, that came later. But then there was another band at uh, uh, the fantastic festival in Britain called the Windsor Jazz and Blues Festival, where I was there and I saw Cream's first gig, I saw Peter, Green, Peter Green's Fleetwood Mac, their, their first gig, and they also were using some twin lead stuff. And um, so those two bands, Blossom Toes and Fleetwood Mac, with a little bit of Fairport Convention, that was the blueprint for Wishbone Ash. And that was the first time I really kind of thought, you know what? Because the thing was, in the mid-60s, by the time you got to the mid-60s, pretty much everything had been done with guitar, actually. Mm -hmm. And um, so the, the natural thing was to really think about how you could keep guitar as a for at the forefront, because it was so exciting, guitar playing, but make it bring something more to the table. Yeah. Melodic. Mel melody, melody, really. So that was what that was the whole thing between, behind the twin thing, yeah. John, can you sit down? Can I sit down? Okay, I'll go. No, no I can go to some of it. That's okay. I don't mind. Listen, this is my best side. Seriously. Um, usually, best seen disappearing into the distance. Um, no, listen. I get in it first, then I know I'm, I'm on top of things. Then, um, the first album was relative. It sounds to me now relatively simple, and, and it, I imagine it was recorded very quickly, which is probably why it still sounds very current. Would that be right? Yeah, I mean. We were just talking briefly out there in the, in the lobby that um, what goes around comes around because now everyone's looking for this sort of veritas. They're looking for um, truth and, um, you know, they don't want artifice anymore. So basically in those days it was all to do with budgets and uh, we had about 10 days to go in there and record. And uh, in fact, what we did with the, uh, the first album was we actually recorded the whole thing before and uh, we did it under on our under our own sort of steam and we uh, finagled studio time at a studio in london called ad vision and at that time yes the band was recording their album the s album and we would creep in at like 11 p.m 12 12 o'clock at night when they were just about done for the day and we would get free virtually free studio time so we recorded the whole album mm -hmm. Uh, in the uh, all through the night, and, um, and then we then we later got our deal with Decca, and they said, you know what, we really like the album, we like the songs, but could you re-record it? Actually, if you listen to the the, the recording that we did, it's virtually identical and it's, it really stands up. But we did re-record it. But um, yeah, I was '69, and it was done. You know, in those days, the first two, even the th almost August, was were done really in the studio. It was just us going in there and playing. You know, we were so intimidated, we were so young. When the engineer said, "I'm rolling," we were like, "Okay," and we just played, and that was it. You know, and you did about three takes, and they say this that was the best one, and um, and that was it. You know, actually, a great way to record, actually. <laughs> How important was Derek Lawrence to you guys? Well, producers ruled the roost in those days, but um, of equal importance to Derek Lawrence, our producer, um, who had also already produced a um, number one hit for Deep Purple at the time, was the engineer Martin Birch, who um, is still, I think, even currently today, the engineer for Iron Maiden, a well-known triple lead guitar band. Um, he was also Fleetwood Mac's engineer. So that was hugely, hugely important to 
um, getting a sound. We wanted a sound like Fleetwood Mac. I mean, they, you know, Peter Green was my idol, you know, and, uh, you know, if we could get our recordings to sound as good as their recordings. Um, so, so both Derek, who worked closely with Martin, um, were, were hugely, hugely important. You know, they, they carried the, the, whole, the whole record, really. There's a nice connection, actually, because Martin worked for Deep Purple as well. And I believe Richie Blackmore kind of gave Derek the sort of nod regarding Wishbone Ash. Absolutely. Um, I don't know, probably some of you guys are familiar with the Richie Blackmore story, but uh, we did a show in, I think it was late 69, opening for Purple. And um, at the sound check, Richie, who's known as a quite a cantankerous man, he's a difficult gentleman to get on with, but for some reason, he was doing his sound check and I kind of cheekily crept up and I'd already got my sound together, plugged in the guitar and started, he would do a little lick and I would jam with him. And he was, he was like, what the, what's going on here? <laughs> and, um, and actually he kind of rose to the, to the occasion and we started jamming. And then he said to me, oh, that was fun. Um, do you guys have a record deal? You know, this was after we'd watched the band a little bit. And um, I said, no. And, uh, he was instrumental, literally, in, uh, in recommending us to Decca in LA. We signed the deal um, with the uh, American side of Decca, which was one of the most fortuitous things that we ever did, because that meant that the albums came out worldwide, as opposed to just being signed with the London subsidiary of Decca. And, um, and that's really been a major part in the longevity of the band, actually. You, I mean, this, thing that we're on now, the On The Blue Cruise, is a festival basically at sea. I remember seeing you at Bickershaw in 1972, and I, I wasn't allowed to go to festivals being only 13, but because it's near Liverpool, I could hop on the bus. And I don't know if you remember, it was on the site of an old coal mine, and it would rain, as it I did, do, right. as it did in May in the UK, and all the, all the mud turned black, so there was no escaping, everybody knew where you'd been. But, um, how many of the big festivals did you do? Because you didn't do the Isle of Wight, but you did these things like Bickershaw, which I thought was a great thing, because the Grateful Dead with a big pull on that. Yeah, Dr. John was on that, a lot of American bands, and, um, well, we did, um, what's the other one, Buxton, I think, Buxton, yeah, Buxton Festival. Yeah. We did uh, stuff down in uh, Devon and Cornwall festivals. I mean, we, we did, um, oh, well, we'd like, we did a ton of festivals in the States, of course. Um, many, many festivals there. The first show that we ever played in the States was um, the Mississippi River Festival. Any people from... Uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, so we did that one. It, that was with The Who, 35,000 people. You know, wow. And that was like, welcome to America. It was great. Mm -hmm. But we did a lot of festivals. Of course, the big one for, for Wishbone was really the Reading Festival, which I mentioned the Windsor Jazz and Blues Festival was a very very worthy, well-known uh, festival. Really came out of the jazz era, jazz and blues, a very serious uh, um, aficionados festival for, you know, uh, folk and uh, for jazz. And then that mutated and became the Reading Festival. And we headlined that a couple of times. So that was probably my favorite festival. Okay, before we move into the, the more modern era, I've got to ask you, the, the Flying Bee, it's synonymous with you. It's become iconic. Was that the guitar that you had from day one with Wishbone? Actually, I remember seeing you on the Old Grey Whistle Test, I think doing Fast Disc from Pilgrimage, and you had it then. But I, I'm not, I don't know how far it went back. That would have been about the beginning. Okay. My use of that guitar, yeah. Um, before that, I, I played a homemade guitar. Um, like Brian May and Queen, I, um, I made my own guitars in those days, and um, partly out of uh, economic... Uh, necessity you know um we and we actually made all our equipment as well the speaker cabinets and so forth but um as soon as we made a little bit of money um i started to look around for a decent guitar and the flying v was uh, it, two of them came into london this is quite a rare beast um nobody really wanted no no self-respecting rock guitar player wanted to play a flying v because it was like well you know it's a little bit too uh Risque, in a way, you know, because the classic guitar was you either played a Telecaster or a Les Paul. And, uh, but then I started playing this guitar, I bought the guitar from a, a store in uh, Denmark Street called Orange. We, we, we had actually gone in there to buy equipment and uh, to take to America to use for the shows. So I bought that, I think you're right, it was about maybe late 71, 72, so it would have been around the pilgrimage time. 
and by the time Argus was recorded, I was permanently used that guitar. And then, of course, um, the music magazines in uh, Britain, which were like the Bible, the Melody Maker, the New Musical Express, I mean, it was all about image, and they were starting to sort of, um, they were selling thousands of these. And of course, my image with the Flying V was quite appealing to the photographers. And, um, and subsequently, the Flying V became one of the three favorite guitars that people like to see guitarists use. And, and now, nowadays, everyone goes, oh, Flying V, that's, that's rock, you know. It actually, it's become a heavy metal instrument, you know. But um, the only other guy I was aware of that played one was, of course, Albert, Albert King. And, um, but that was a different feel. That wasn't rock, that was blues, and uh, he'd always played the, the Flying V. I remember seeing Dave Davis one. Well, Dave the 60s, Davis, definitely. There yeah. weren't many on of TV. Yeah. 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 But I, I remember it got you on the front page of Melody Maker. I remember yeah, that. I'll do anything. anything. I'm a whore. Yeah. What can I tell you? <laughs> um, I watched you the other night. The twin guitar thing. It, it just seems so easy. It's like from you to him. And it's like, how easy is, is that to sort of communicate between you? Because it just seems like almost telepathic. <laughs> 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 this is Mark. He's, he'll tell you what he's. Well, he's got a unique take on it because Mark is. You can see he's a lot younger than me, right? But he started playing our music at age nine, oh, yeah. so um, he's kind of ingrained in you, really, isn't it? And I mean, as far as like we didn't know that we could play together until we tried it. Yeah. Quite a few years. And. Lines. I, I knew most most of both parts of the, the lines to start with. He would remind me of my part. <laughs> no, it doesn't go like this. It goes like that. Yeah. And then he'd correct me again. <coughs> so, yeah. Oh, where are you from? I'm from Leeds. Leeds, oh. I, I hope. Hey. All right. Hey. Hey. Well, listen, I, the, 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 what I saw throughout the set, and, and particularly during Blowing Free, which is the last song, it was, it was like just backwards and forwards, and you could almost see it, literally, and it sounded incredible. Um, Mark, what, have you always played a Les Paul? Les Paul, Struts, classics. Uh, okay, the classics, okay. Time guitars, yeah. yeah. But mainly Les Pauls. Because as, as, in the original Wishbone Nash, Ted used to occasionally use a Strat, and I remember they had a great Black Beauty Les, uh, Les Paul, fabulous guitar. But um, well, and then Laurie went into the more into the strat side of things, didn't he? Yeah, Laurie, I'd say, was primarily uh, initially was a um, Telecaster player. He's a picker, really, and the Telecaster is known as a country guitar, and that's the roots that Laurie Weinstein came from. But Ted was, you know, he would do the even the, the mellow parts of the music were always on a strat, clean sound, almost a Hank Marvin sound, and then the Les Paul that was Ted's thing, and. Beautifully, um, Mark is also a fantastic Les Paul player. It's a great feel for that particular instrument. Um, but you're also great on the Strat too. So, yeah, yeah. I mean, you're one of Mark's uh, favourite guitar players. Is Mark Knopfler? And I would be right in saying, right? Yeah. yeah. Who is a great Strat player? Yeah. Didn't you play a Strat though? I mean, yeah, I'll I'm play thinking, anything. Yeah, I'm I mean, thinking of the song. If you'll get me on the front of the magazine, I'll play it. I'm thinking of the song uh, <laughs> Underground. From yes. the Brave. Very good. Yeah. Yeah, well, I mean, tellies, I've, I've played a, a telly. Uh, actually, a lot of times when you think you're hearing a Flying V on record, it's actually a Telecaster. Uh, and I have an old 52 Telecaster that used to belong to Roy Buchanan. And that's my uh, go to recording guitar. I can do anything on that guitar. The only thing it doesn't have is a whammy bar, which is like, that's my crutch, you know, that's my pole to part my sound. But I can do pretty much anything on a telly. But I also, yeah, I'll, I had strats. Um, and of course, back in the day, uh, when we first came to the States, we would go around all the pawn shops and... Um, P-R-R-N. P-R-R-N? Yeah, all the pawn places, yeah. We, we visited all of them. And, uh, <laughs> so anyway, um, yeah, we would pick up these fantastic instruments. Uh, I mean, the, the going rate for any kind of Fender from the 1950s was 300 bucks. I was at 300 bucks, and you could uh, you end up with these incredible instruments that we would then feature on our albums. Okay, Bob, 21 years in the band, and, yeah. and everybody knows the, the twin guitar sound, but the other thing about Wishbone Ash, and I think some people, sometimes people forget, there are incredible bass lines that run through the, the entire catalogue. 
And I can remember seeing you at a very small gig. It's probably one of your very early gigs with Wishbone, actually, because I'd seen with you previously. Yeah, with you. And I'd seen you previously with Steve Oberlin's mob oh, as yeah, well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, I can remember thinking, God, this guy's obviously, you know, he's been woodshedding. Because you, you just kind of slotted right in. So, I mean, how was it for you coming into Wishbone? Because as I said, the bass is just as important in Wishbone. Absolutely. Well, first of all, I'd been for about 10 to 15 years before that, I'd only played fretless bass. That wasn't going to work in this band at all. So I had to ditch that immediately. And, um, and then Martin's sound was really kind of pretty hard and pretty and his style. I think he was kind of a guitar player, really, come bass player, wasn't yes, he? he was so, more of a guitar player. so he thought, although his lines are bass lines, there were a lot of kind of guitar, that's where it turned into like a third harmony part. Uh, so it was, it was a whole new thing for me, because I've been a bass player in many bands, never sung before either, but uh, and always sort of stood uh, back doing a bass player's regular job, you know, and suddenly it's like a third guitar, it's like, wow, it's quite, quite, quite a, a journey. Actually. Yeah, it's, it's almost, it's very like, I would say, McCartney and Jeff yeah. Bruce, that kind of almost yeah, lead yeah. bass. But they sing over it as well. I gave up playing bass because of Jeff Bruce and Paul McCartney, I thought, you know, I'm never going to be anywhere close. So I just kind of tootle around now these days. But it, it is, it's, it's something that's really important and you slotted right in. And uh, you continue to do so as well. <laughs> uh, again, the drumming, we had the great Steve Upson for a long, long time, who, a right-handed drummer playing a left-handed kit. Yeah, well, it's the opposite to Ringo Starr. Ringo was a left-handed guy who played a right-handed kit. Yeah. So I guess there was, and I always marveled at Steve, the way he played the kit, because he played it open. Yeah, open-handed. Yeah. yeah, a bit like Simon Phillips does, but I mean, Simon's a bit like an octopus, really. Well, yeah, yeah you know. <laughs> he's ambidextrous. He is, yeah. I mean, I'm sure he's got eight arms and legs, that guy. But um, again, it all added to the sound. So, I mean, coming into the band, well, you've been there a while now, of course. Yeah, So. Exactly. Like you're not the new guy anymore, so the jokes are on him, on tour. <laughs> if you tour with a band, they'll know what we're talking about. It's murder sometimes. Um, so, coming into the band, were you, were you aware of the catalogue before that, and the band? I had never heard of Wishbone Ash. Okay. <laughs> I hired Joe in about three minutes, and I said, can you play? Because he was recommended by a fantastic drummer who played with us, what was the, by the name of Mike Sturgis. And, I, and Mike, Mike was, went off to work in a music school. He said, if you want a guy who plays like me, this is the guy. So that, that's how that happened, right? Yeah, I got a text message from Mike. I was at my parents' house. And uh, he said, I think he just said, do you want to join Wishbone Ash? And my mum was in the kitchen and I said, have you heard of this band? And she said, yeah, that's your Uncle Peter's favorite band. Like, <laughs> okay. Because <laughs> I grew up listening to a lot of sort of 60s and 70s music my dad was musical and very into like zeppelin and queen and all those kind of things but wishbone i don't think he had any wishbone ash albums but Damn. my uncle had them all <laughs> which I, I actually i'm kind of glad about that because a lot of bands that i listened to and might have been excited to you know i want to go play with this band i probably would have wanted to go in and play them exactly like the recording and copy every note that the drummer on those things did but because I didn't know this music and I didn't have a lot of time to learn it because I spoke to Andy on the phone and he said can you come and record an album <coughs> in Finland <laughs> in like two weeks time um, and I said sure and then he said there's a UK tour which is going to be a month long and that's going to happen you know when the album's finished and he sent me Argus and Clam Destiny and a live recording from one of the more recent shows they've done in America. And so I figured I'll go record the album and then I'll come back and I'll learn the material for the tour. And I think three or four days before flying out to record this, um, he called me up and said, by the way, can we do a gig in the middle? Of, you know, would it be okay to do a, a gig? And I, I was like, uh... <laughs> Sure. <laughs> so I had like three or four days to learn a two hour set, which had some songs in it that, we, I mean, if you, you know the music, it's like some strange changes, like Phoenix, which has got a lot of uh, a big improvised section in the middle. Um, 
so I'm listening to it, kind of trying to figure out what the structure is, and then when I finally met them, and I, I'd written it out, and I was like, okay, there's 17 and a half bars of this, and this happens, and, and Bob said, no, no, just listen for when I play this thing, you know. But because we only had 10 days to record this new album of material, we only got to rehearse this, like, we played each song once in the studio. That's and my then, start. Wow. That's my leadership start. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And I didn't, I, I, I met, shreds, has it? I met Bob um, before, like, he came down to a rehearsal I was doing with the David Cross band. Yeah, exactly. So just so he could actually play. Yeah. And yeah. Like one song, I thought, oh, no. But I, I was playing. I couldn't follow the stuff you were doing. King Crimson. Yeah. It was, it was like King Crimson stuff, but the vocalist wasn't wasn't there, so it was instrumental versions. That was like really crazy sounded of stuff. Yeah. Um, but he turned up in his jag, and I thought, okay, I can, I can <laughs> get on board with this. Good money. Um, Could be a future here. <laughs> so we, um, yeah. So we flew to. Can you tell where, we, where the gig was, though. Oh, we're well, in Moscow. Yeah, the yeah. in Moscow. Sorry, <laughs> could you just break off the recording? Uh, we've got to get this thing finished in 10 days. But by the way, can we go to Moscow by, yeah. by train? So I met Andy for the first time and Muddy um, when they picked us up at the airport in Finland. So that, that was my welcome to the band. And then the next morning we started recording The Power of Eternity. Um, and I think that was like it's maybe Monday or something and then on Thursday we took a 13 hour train ride to overnight. Moscow overnight so As you four, do. four of us in one cabin in this thing so that was a good way to get to know everybody get to know each other <laughs> I should have been a big red flag that was the clue to what was going to make interesting <laughs> <laughs> and then we did a, did a gig and it, we got through it oh it was yeah 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 it was, and, I don't think we've ever I think we were playing for the, Ru- we we were playing for the Russian Mafia, I think. <laughs> and then we got back on the train again and, and resumed recording in a, in a, it was a disused cement factory in the middle of a logging camp in bloody darkest Finland in the middle of winter. It was about as miserable. I thought if he could get through that, he can do anything. And it's proved to be the case. Yeah. Well, he, he's still here. Okay. What, he's still smiling. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you seem to, the, the, the thing with Wishbone Ash, there's been some key drawers, obviously Steve Ops, and then you had, um, I think, Ray Wilson, and, and then, of course, Mike Sturgis. And now we have Joe. And it, it seems to be that you like stability behind you, if you pardon the pun. It's an English joke. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Well, I mean, uh, you know, everyone focuses on the guitars of Wishbone Ash, and um, of course, it's hugely, it is a guitar band. Um, you know, if, if I didn't have to sing, we could probably carry a set by playing instrumentals and guitar and so on and so forth. Um, incidentally, did anyone see Johnny A playing out there on the. Uh, yeah. Oh my God! What an awesome guitar player. Yeah. I mean, you know, um, I said to Mark, you better watch out. I was, <laughs> I, that's my kind of guitar player, you know, fantastic player. And um, so, yeah, it's always all about the guitars, which but the, 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 the tricky thing, really, the, the rhythm section, is because of Steve Upton and Martin Turner, it's just so important because we composed our music. I mean, there were some songs where, like, for example, Blowing Free, it's kind of like a riffing, groovy, boogie number. We, we play that style of music, but so much of our music, it goes, it goes into prog territory. So to have guys like, um, I mean, these guys can actually read notes on a musical notes. I mean, it, it, bizarrely, I mean, yeah, it's true. You, you put, it's the old story, the old joke. If you put a you know, uh, musical score in front of a couple of big guitar players, they'll just, run a mile but uh, so you know to have that technicality but you know Bob is a groove master as well as being um, I mean, Martin Turner was a, as he said more of a, a guitar player turn bass player and would compose bass lines that were very um, almost classical in a way yeah. um, but but I think the component that Bob brought to Wishbone Ash more so than Martin even was the groove factor so he combines playing lead lines and I even got him to pick up a pick and, and start playing with a pick and he's, he does that as well but he can do it all, he can play as he said, he can play stand up bass, fretless and read the notes and the same with Joe, Joe can play groove and, but he can also get into some crazy technicalities so that's what a band like Wishbone Ash actually really needs so hugely important, the rhythm section Okay, if we can set up the mic, has anybody got any questions out here? Because we can set up a mic and you can ask them, okay, can we set up the mic and uh, these people can uh, ask the guys some questions? 
Mom, before we get this set up, if I can ask you, a lot of bands these days are not able to record albums and bring them out, and yet Wishbone Ash still do. And I was just talking to Rick Derringer a little earlier, and he's going to be doing that. And it, it seems to be almost like a lot of artists from that period are sticking their toe back in the water, but you guys have just carried on doing well, it regardless. I couldn't be doing this if I, w if I didn't feel vital. And if I didn't feel that the band that we had was a band, I, I can't be, I can't be having a band or being a band that's like some kind of aping the past thing. So I think we we all get a huge buzz out of being continually creative, and we've been really creative for the last 25 years. We've put out probably more records than most bands um, of our era have done. Um, we, we're just not content to to, to rest on our laurels, and, and we're going to be doing another album soon. So. Um, it's been really important, and it, to me, it, it's important that um, any anyone that's new to the band, like Mark, you know, I, you know, I want them to feel part of this and feel that they're putting their mark on it, and they want to feel that too. So, um, and it's been the case with all, with the three of us. Um, we put out a lot of music, haven't we? Really, when you think about it, yeah. since the old days. Some people are not aware of that. I mean, we're going to Japan um, next month, and in Japan, our, they think our recording career ended about 18 years ago I think so they're not aware of this more recent stuff because you know we're a we're a gigging band that's just putting out albums on small labels you've got to you've got to seek it out you've got to seek out a new Wishbone Ash album but they're, they're there and it's some fabulous music I'm very proud of it anyway you did have some albums come out from Japan live albums that didn't come out anywhere else yeah that's true we've had a couple of live albums from back in the day but not, uh, I don't think a lot of the recent studio albums have come out there, so. Okay, if you've got a question, would you like to come to this microphone and so we can pick it up? Step right up to the mic. The microphone is yours, sir. Well, I wanted to thank you for the box set. The box set that came out was just awesome. Isn't that awesome? It was very good. Yeah, the box set. <laughs> uh, so, on that note, any chance that we get a super box set of light dates, volume one? That has all the you know maybe all, all, nights, all of the nights. Well you, know, well, you know that's a good question. Thank um, you. Thank you. Uh, what we did when we produced the live dates album, we cherry picked the best um, songs and the best nights from.